Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnavale, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, and, of course, one of the founding partners of the Dividend Kings. And for this week's video and installment, I want to talk about the current state of the market a little bit and try to focus more on strategy rather than picking individual stocks, because I do believe that the concept of, you know, different strokes for different folks is very, very important when it comes to investing. In other words, I don't believe one size fits all. I don't believe there is a perfect investment strategy that applies to everybody. And I also believe that there are investment strategies that need to be altered depending on what, you know, the current situation and with either the markets or the economy or whatever is prevailing at the time. And today, of course, as I mentioned in the introduction, we're facing extraordinary times. You know, the COVID pandemic has been a once in a hundred year type event. I know I've been doing this for 50 years. I've never seen anything like it. I've never experienced a time where they literally shut down great businesses to the point where at no fault of management, the companies couldn't even produce any type of, you know, revenues or cash flows or earnings. And then many of them, even some of them had were forced as a result to cut their dividends. So normally, historically, I've been a believer in always being fully invested at all times. And I've predicated that on the notion that, frankly, it's a market of stocks, not a stock market. And what that means is, I don't care if we're in a bear market or a bull market, I've never seen a market in my career where I couldn't find attractive investments to be able to build a portfolio with. Now, in bull markets, raging bull markets, it's harder typically than it is to find good investments than you get in a bear market. Now, most people find it harder in a bear market. Of course, I love bear markets if I'm you know, focused on investing or building positions for the long term, because that's where the best bargains are going to be found. But regardless, there's always something to be found. And that's no different today. What is different today, however, is there's more uncertainty, I think, associated with this market than I've ever experienced or seen in my career. And as a result, for the first time, I'm holding rather substantial cash positions. And it depends. It can be as much as 30%, you know, in some cases 50%, a lot of cases 15 or 20%, but I am not in a hurry to get the cash positions that I have invested. Although having said that, that doesn't mean that I'm sitting and it doesn't mean that I'm scared or frozen. What it simply means is, you know, I'm kind of doing like a little kid would for Christmas. I'm making my lists and checking them twice. And what today's video and talk is going to be about is the list of companies that I've identified as for my own personal strategies and feelings about investing, risk tolerances, goals, objectives, that kind of thing. A group of companies that I'm ready to invest when I feel comfortable doing it. And frankly, at this stage, that's probably going to happen right after the election. That could be in middle November, that could be in December, or it could even fall out into late January. It just depends on how things unfold. But the key is I want to be ready to invest. I think you could invest today, probably. And you know, that risk that I'm seeing or talking about may be overblown. But I do believe that extraordinary times like today require extraordinary action. So I'm sitting on a little bit of cash. Everything I'm invested in, I feel is already very inexpensive. And I've got lots of opportunities. And I know I'll have ample opportunities to invest in the future at very attractive rates. So I'm going to go over my top buy list. I'm going to show you how I manage that list utilizing the FastGraph research tool. So to start out with, I'm going to go into the portfolio section of FastGraphs and look at the portfolio review. And what you're going to see here is a list of stocks. I've got 46 stocks on my what I call my core income buy list. These are stocks that I could on a moment's notice invest in. I'm researching all these companies. I'm evaluating all these companies. I'm using this portfolio review to keep track of their valuations and et cetera. And I've got, you know, targets depending on what the needs are, whether I'm looking for income or whether I'm looking for less current income, more income growth, more current income, you know, with less concern about dividend growth, although I'm always concerned about both at all times. It's just the magnitude of those that it's going to be different. So what I've got here is I've got the Fast Graph Portfolio Review, and I've got 46 names in here. Now, I can scroll through all of these names, you know, like this, or I can keep it in these 10 top 10 segments here because it, it lists 10 at a time. And I can order that by P.E. ratios, lowest to highest. This was one of the metrics that I showed in the written portion. Earnings yield is going to relate to that. Obviously, the low P.E. ratio is going to relate to high earnings yields. So by utilizing this feature where I can, which is like any spreadsheet where I can organize it by lowest to highest, I can keep track 
of the stocks that meet my criteria. And if you, those of you who follow my work know, I'm looking for an earnings yield of at least six and a half to seven percent ish. And that's an ish. That's not a perfect number. And as you can see, the majority of the stocks on this list have that. Now, as I go further down the list, I do start to run into some companies that don't meet that any longer. However, in some cases, it will be something like Omega Healthcare, which is actually a REIT. And in that case, I'm going to go to cash flow yield. And I kind of have the same standard. I want to see at least the 7% cash flow yield, or it's actually FFO yield to be more technical. And of course, it meets that criteria, you know, by in spades. It has a 5.4% earnings yield, but earnings isn't the metric that's appropriate for REITs, it's cash flow. So I take those things into consideration. But what I'm really looking at here is a way to organize the investment. Now, another thing that I might want to do is I might want to be focused on impeccable quality at one point or another. So I can then start by looking at credit ratings and I can list them by order of the highest to lowest credit ratings and then simultaneously look for those that still give me the earnings yield that I'm looking for with the highest credit rating. So I can, you know, kind of organize the list that way. I can look at long term debt to capital highest to lowest, lowest to highest, and look for those companies. I can organize the list by dividend yield. And I'm doing this, it's helping me make, keep my strategy basically focused on what I'm looking for. So if I have a situation where I need extremely high yield, I'm going to look at dividend yield, and I'm going to look for these higher dividend yield stocks. And I might blend those in with some lower yielding stocks that have high quality but have good dividend records. And then things like dividend growth will be, you know, become very relevant. So let me give you an example of that. Let me, I can also order this just in alphabetic order. So let's start by looking at Amgen, okay, a company that is historically been, it's, a, it's the world's largest biotech company. It's historically been a growth stock. And as you can see here in the early years of this graph going back to 2001 and, and before then, this was a growth stock. And you can see the numbers down here, 12%, 18%. 37%, you know, 30, 22. But then as time goes on here, you'll start to see these numbers begin to slow down. Now, the long term growth rate here is 13.81%. If I shorten that time frame by several years, it's still 11%. Okay, if I shorten it even some more, you know, it's now 8%. That's typical. This is a $130 billion, $33 billion market cap company now. And it's obviously getting harder to grow fast. But what tends to happen with these companies as we came out of the Great Recession and in 2011, they instituted their dividend. Now, in this case, what we have here is still a situation where I've been looking more for the growth of the dividend. The current yield, if I bought the stock today, is 2.8 percent. All right. But if I look at the company's dividend record and I'll go here in the performance graph, since they've paid a dividend, they've grown it at an extraordinary rate. But I do want you to notice that rate has slowed down as well. So if I shorten the time frame here short enough, you'll see that that dividend growth rate is still almost double. You know, it's still 18, 19 percent. But the point is, its dividend is growing every year and it's growing very quickly. So what that means is that my growth yield, you know, had you bought it in 2015, the beginning of 2015, your current yield would have been 2%. Today, that yield would be up to 3.6%. So it's growing very fast. But even today at 2.8%, there are other situations out here where you can have better numbers. By the way, this is something else I want to interject here. This is really a quintessential example of the kind of company I like. I like companies with consistent, you know, year after year historical operating growth. I like companies, if they pay a dividend, to have consistent year after year dividend growth. Now, I'll make these adjustments with the rates and things as I've been suggesting, but what's important is now price is not even on this graph. What I'm looking at here is the business behind the stock. Okay, now, as I mentioned in, in the article, I'm looking for valuation. So I'm looking for optimum times to invest in the stock. Now, here's a case where it was a very popular growth stock back here. And this was still, you know, coming into the irrational exuberant era, kind of the end of the tech bubble, if you will. And Amgen was very, very expensive. Now, the business was doing awesome during this time, but had you bought it back here in January of 2001 and held it to the end of September 2011, you'd have actually had a negative rate of return. You'd have lost 2.2%. And keep in mind, there was no dividend income at this time at all. Now, in contrast, had you bought it when it was undervalued below the orange line, metaphorically speaking, and held it till today, 
your rate of return would have been 18.8% and you would have received a nice chunk of dividend income as well because not only did the company start paying a dividend, but it grew it very rapidly. So if I'm looking out to the future with Amgen, I'm looking for, you know, six or seven percent growth. I've got a three percent dividend yield. I believe this company is capable of generating double digit rates of return, but it's not a real high yield situation. Now, I can contrast that with a different type of dividend. And I'll even call this a dividend growth stock, although that may be stretching it a little bit. But let's go to AT&T, which has been, you know, really kind of in the news here recently. Um, Adam Sensei wrote about it recently. The price has been faltering. I'd like to point out a couple of things about this company. What you're looking at from here back approximately is Southwestern Bell. It, it was a different company. And then Southwestern Bell bought AT&T and they took on the iconic name and the stock symbol. And this is AT&T since Southwestern Bell bought them. And of course, they also have been morphing from a landline company to a you know video streaming company, as well as an internet company, as well as a wireless cell phone company. And so when we're looking here, though, the company's growth rate has been rather slow. It's only averaging about 3.6% growth which is a huge contrast to what we saw with Amgen. However, I've got a 7.36% current dividend yield thanks to the real low valuation. Now, if I look at history, the dividend yield has been kind of consistent. Dividend growth yield has been kind of consistent with the company's earnings growth. You know, it's only growing the dividend a couple of percent a year. But you're starting out with such a high dividend yield that you could blend this at, you know, 7% plus with under 3% and end up with a 45 or 5% total dividend yield by combining Amgen and AT&T. And that's kind of how I approach this. But here's the main point I want to get across with this video. I know AT&T is extremely inexpensive today. You know, I'm ready to buy this when I finally feel like it's time to start getting the cash I have on hand invested. I'm going to be jumping on AT&T if I'm looking for yield and I'll, you know, be able to instantly invest in Amgen if I'm looking for less yield and more growth. Now, I also want to point out there are situations here that I am keeping track of, but I recognize that they're overvalued today. OK, and that would be. Now, none of these REITs, because these REITs, I'm looking at them from a cash flow, you know, point of view. And there are some of them are Cyrus One is a little bit expensive, in my opinion. But what I do want to see, I want to look at a name like Medtronic, which is a company that I really, really like and have owned it in the past and made a lot of money over the years. But there are also times where the valuation of the stock becomes excessively crazy. It's very similar to what I showed you with Amgen. This was a very expensive stock back in the irrational exuberant era. And I won't hit the peak here. I'll just hit there. You could have owned this stock for more than a decade and actually had a negative rate of return. And in this case, you were dealing with a company that was not only growing their profits year after year after year, they were also growing their dividend year after year. So if you looked at their dividend growth rates during that time frame, they were very, very high. And, you know, you'd have done very well, you know, from a standpoint of investing in this company if you could have bought it at an attractive valuation. Now, when a great recession came along, it went into a slump for many years. That's very typical. But what the bottom line is, you could have bought it any time in here. I'll just, you know, click and pick a spot and held it till today. Your rate of return would be almost 13 percent a year just because you bought it at a good valuation, a big contrast to holding it here when it was also growing very strongly, but the valuation was very high. Now, I could also, and I like to say this all the time, measuring performance without measuring valuation is a job half done. I believe what this stock should be being valued at is something closer to here. So instead of a 13% rate of return, I would be expecting about a 9% rate of return based on valuation to valuation. And I look at stocks and I think of them this way. I never let the stock price dictate my view of the business. I focus on the fundamentals of the business. Now, obviously, Medtronic suffered with COVID, where I showed you a stock like Amgen didn't. And frankly, AT&T didn't have much stress as far as COVID was concerned, a little bit, but not much. But again, they aren't growing that fast anyway. So the point is, you know, it's extraordinary times. I've got my list ready. Next week, I'll be talking about my total return list. But I want you to just get the idea here that I can take this list and massage it and manipulate it and mix different kind of companies together to create an outcome that I want, whether it's above average yield with moderate growth, an above average growth or yield with maybe high dividend growth or any combination of those. Or if I just want to go for pure high yield, I might focus more on 
you know, the stocks that I own that have these highest yields here. But again, I want to do that judiciously and I want to make sure that I maintain a diversification strategy amongst them all. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnarell saying thanks for watching. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel as well. All of us at Dividend Teams appreciate you and, you know, thanks for watching. I'll be talking to you again real soon.